Hi guys, it's good to see you all um, and thank you as always. Um, I appreciate all the support and feedback I get. Um, I want to talk about um, in the start of this, everyone was under the assumption that it was a crime of passion um, until the, I mean everybody, and I'll, I'll try and show you a few things, but um, the police came out and said, no, 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 it's isolated and it's targeted, but we don't know who, why or what. So targeted and isolated means it was somebody known, which I can understand why people would say crime of passion. Um, it's, it's obvious to me, but this whole targeted attack and some big kingpings coming in and, and I think it was much more personal, guys. And uh, I'm going to try and show you today what I mean. So bear with me as always and I'll put things up as it comes along. Thanks, guys. I'm just going to read this along, but I don't have my glasses on and it's kind of small, so bear with me. So this was a Daily Mail story and it was 12th of December 2022. Um, exclusive, quote, somewhere along the line, something bad happened. That pissed someone off enough to go after them, retired Moscow police captain says. Idaho killer was motivated by revenge as victim Kaylee's father reveals she had big open wounds. Gungalvis said his daughter's wounds definitely did not match those of Mogan, who was found in the same bed as Kaylee, after asking coroner Kathy Mabet how many times each victim was stabbed. Retired Moscow police captain Paul Kawakatsky, 64, said it is likely the video uh, Idaho murderer knew at least one victim and may have been motivated by revenge. Maybe there was only one target and the other three were collateral damage. Why they were targeted, nobody knows yet, he told DailyMail.com. Kawakatsky, who spent 20 years investigating local homicides, spoke as a quadruple murder investigation enters its fourth, fourth week without a suspect. On Monday, victim Kaylee Gungalvis, father Steve, revealed she had sustained big open gouges and that her wounds definitely did not match those of her friends. The retired Moscow police captain, who spent 20 years investigating every local homicide in Idaho City, says it is likely the perpetrator responsible for the murder of the four college students last month knew at least one of the victims and may have been seeking vengeance. When you use the word targeted, it means somewhere along the line we met. Former Moscow police captain Paul Kawakowski, 64, told the DailyMail.com in an exclusive interview. Somewhere along the line, something bad happened, something that pissed someone off enough to go after these people. Kawakowski spoke amid mounting pressure for authorities to make a breakthrough in the quadruple murder investigation, which is yet to zero in on a suspect or late locate a murder weapon. Nearly a month after Kaylee Goncalves, Madison Mogan, Zaina Canodal and Ethan Chapin were knifed to death in their off-campus home. The former Moscow police captain said it is possible the murderer may have targeted one victim and the others became collateral damage. Pictured victims Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Zaina Canodal and Ethan Chapman. Members of the Moscow Police Department and Idaho State Police were seen last week collecting and removing personal effects and property from the scene of the quadruple murder in the off-campus residence on the University of Idaho. Kaylee's father, Stephen Gonsalves, has publicly aired his frustrations over the bungled police investigation into the gruesome murder of his daughter, who 
was last week revealed to have suffered significantly more brutal injuries than her three friends. And on Monday, the bereaved dad shared new details of those injuries, revealing Kaylee had sustained big open gouges and that the knife slashed opened her liver and lungs. So what we know, guys, is this was a targeted, isolated, very personal, for personal gain attack. Um, so there, there could have only been someone profiting from this. Um, the, the first press conferences where the police said it was, was a targeted attack um you know i i do believe if you go back to the start that that's the information um because since then nobody's saying anything so personal isolated targeted there's a is a a good chance these these are very very known to the victims um, and I, I just think if if someone was going to all this trouble you know and then if we're saying somebody's being framed or certainly not all the information is out there then Whoever committed this can only be gaining from it because it's it's a whole lot of it's a whole lot of work if you're not gaining from it. I mean, we know this isn't um, a, a serial K because they wouldn't gain anything. This wouldn't be a personal isolated attack. Um, there's no proof of stalkers, there's no proof of anything like that, so it must have been people that these college students were around regularly, that they didn't see the threat that was being posed. This was a ambush, very much so, I think. Hence why it was targeted, why the isolation and targeted words keep coming up. Um, this wasn't a one-man plan. Uh, absolutely not. Um, I think we all just need to keep our heads and not always go by just the news reports, but use them as a base because that's information they've been given by law enforcement. So... Um, but I've said it before and I'll say it again, you know, if it looks like crap, then it probably is crap. So let's just, uh, let's keep our wits about us and uh, isolated, targeted, no threat to the public, no stalker, no SK. I mean, a targeted attack is a crime of passion, so yeah. You guys remember my very first video? Um, I transcribed as best as I could at that time the um, audio that came from the next door neighbour's ring cam. Um, that was quickly debunked but they debunked it by a news reporter saying that the person who made the video was just doing some sort of <clears throat> test or I mean I can't I'll try and find the clip because it's hilarious but well for the last few days I've been working on that video 
and uh, and it's so strange actually because I saw somebody reposted one of my videos the other day. I was already like a day or two into this and it was that very first video of the next door neighbours recap or wherever that ring cam was. Um, so it was really interesting and a, and a very big sign that what I started doing was exactly the path I'm meant to be going down. So today I'm going to share you with you what is actually on that audio that the next door neighbour debunked by saying it was some sort of domestic violence or or a test to see. I, I can't remember, but I'm going to show you guys here. The neighbors uh, to my left here have a surveillance video camera that picked up audio from Zana Kernodal's room about 50 feet away, about 417, hearing uh, the dog begin to bark, hearing a loud thud and what sounded like either whispers or whimpering at around 417 during the time of the murders. So uh, circulating online are posts like the ones you see on the screen of this alleged audio of that surveillance video here. And so being on the ground, I spoke with the neighbors here. Paul's going to pan over here how close this home is, this blue home that we've seen next to the crime scene where that surveillance video would be. I caught the people living there walking out earlier and they have debunked that audio. It is not the audio from that surveillance video. So I think that's important to clear up because those posts have gone so viral. But you can see behind me just how close that blue home where that surveillance video would be to Xana Cronoldo's room right up there on the second floor to be able to pick that up. And before anyone says anything, I know this audio is certainly not the audio that that Joseph Morris put out with a scream. Um, this is nothing like that. Uh, this audio, now that I've broken it down a bit better, I can tell you all is about five clips, maybe six put together. Um, and you're gonna see in a minute when I break it down that it sort of jumps about. So a couple of seconds is um, like talking and then it cuts to a different part cuts to a different part so it's really hard to follow along but yeah I, I, I do think this now I've broken it down and removed some of the noise Um, I don't know how it's not real uh, but I'll let you all have a look and see what you think So this audio, like I said, has obviously been clicked about. Some bits is people actually talking. Some bits sounds like people on the phone. Um, but what I got from this was that perhaps, you know, the 12 pings in the area, maybe, and I am just theorising, guessing speculation whatever word you want to use this is just my own thoughts feelings and that's it but 
could Brian Koberger have been dropping stuff off there once a week? Because clearly the audio states that it was Brian Koberger's gear. So somebody stole from him and then Hello, set him up. Mommy. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think somebody stole the gear that was in the house. Um, and I think it went too far. I don't think it was meant to go that far. Um, and I think maybe if Brian Koberger was a delivery guy, maybe someone informed him later. And uh, that's why he headed on around the area to see if he could see anything going on. Uh, maybe then that's why he came back in the morning for that 10 minutes. Um, I mean, that makes more sense than him just sitting there for 10 minutes and then going, or him planting his own DNA at the scene. That doesn't make sense. So, but could he have gone in that house to see what was going on to see if the rumours were true perhaps and there was maybe some witnesses to him popping in there for five minutes seven minutes whatever it is they trying to say crime happened maybe there's witnesses that say that um, he must have done the crime because he was the delivery guy or, you know, um, I don't believe he did this crime, guys. I think they stole from him and set him up. Again, I need to say that this is pure speculation. It's purely based on stuff I've heard in different audios and you know just the knowledge we've learnt through the case um, so I just want to make sure that's very very clear um, I'm not accusing Brian Koberger of being anything or anyone I just it just makes more sense that's all guys I also want to talk about um you remember when Kaylee reported the missing person uh, and she gave, apparently gave her address as 1122 King Road and this was a year before she lived there. Um, that doesn't make sense. Uh, and I mean, we can speculate that maybe she knew she was going to live there a year before or maybe because Maddie was living there. Um, I don't know, but to, to me it makes more sense that that address was put in later. And what I mean by that was, you know, we keep asking ourselves why, why did that police officer take a picture of Kaylee's ID? Um, so they had her all her details, her address, everything on that ID. It just makes me think it was added later and maybe that's what that was for. Which is so strange. It's a, it's a whole nother situation. But it doesn't make sense that she gave that address a year before she lived there. It makes more sense that her, that address was added later and they were tying up loose ends. Um, you know. Uh, it just makes more sense that, again, it's just my speculation, guessing, a theory, whatever you want to say. Um, and it's weird how she reported, when she reported that missing person, she reported the person as staring at her and her boyfriend. 
But Kaylee never actually said that she knew this woman. She just said she recognised her from a poster. So how did that woman know Kaylee? Why was she staring at her? And was she staring at Jack and not Kaylee? It's, it's, a, it's a whole different case, I understand, but I don't believe in coincidence and uh, that's just how I feel, guys. So, guys, um, I, <laughs> I want to talk about something that's um, it's insignificant in, in many ways, but... Um, I've been in to speak about it for months and months and months and I've never got around to it. And every now and again, a, a creator will pop up with the same question and and it comes back to my mind and then I forget again. So um, that bloody ladder, that ladder, the one that was wedged up against the ledge for Zana and Ethan's window. Um, <sighs> there's, there's no way that anyone that lived in that house left that ladder like that and I'm gonna explain why and show you pictures but the ladder was never left against that wall like that it was always laid on the floor um, and there's a reason for that uh, and there's a reason why you don't leave ladders laying up against the wall here where I live and that is because the winters are quite tough uh, they're quite windy and snowy and we had snow just a few days ago um, and we'll probably get a little bit of snow in April as well. Um, it's not uncommon here to get wintry weather in spring or autumn so there's no way anyone in that house left the ladder like that um, and that is because of the weather and that ladder where it sits and where the cars would park, if that if there was a little bit of wind going down by that house, that ladder would be smashed into whatever car was there. Um, I mean, that police car parked there for weeks and weeks and weeks, and that ladder was still there. That ladder was still there until that house came down, pretty much. Um, so, yeah, it seems insignificant, and I suppose it is, really. But I just don't believe anyone in that house left left the ladder like that, because they would know. Um, it's probably fallen on somebody's car before, and that's why they knew to always lay it down. Um, so I was just it's just something I've wanted to say for a long, 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 long time, and I keep forgetting, so... There you go. <laughs>